Okay, welcome back to the afternoon session. The first speaker of the afternoon is Alicia Habari, an axiomatic theory of non bayesian social learning. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the kind invitation and thank you all for being here. So I'm gonna tell you a brief summary of some of our uh, recent and continuing work on uh, developing a, an axiomatic theory of, uh, for, of non-Bayesian and Bayesian social learning in networks. This is basically the idea of trying to figure out how people in groups make uh, decisions based on their private observations and opinions of others. This is joint work with my former students, uh, Pouya Moulavi and Ali Reza Salehi and Amin Rahimian. So um, there's a lot of evidence that suggests that opinions of individuals in, uh, in networks are often uh, influenced by their private observations and opinions of uh, friends, neighbors, and, and others. And uh, there's a, sort of been a continuing theme of research across multiple disciplines in trying to figure out how individuals combine their private observations and opinions of their peers when uh, these observations are not shared, but it's only the opinions that are shared. Whether it's in making political decisions on which candidate to vote for, or in trying to decide, you know, based on reviews, which theater to go to or which restaurant to go to. So this has led to a, um, basically, a, a longstanding set of uh, questions in uh, how should individuals combine uh, their own observations and, and, uh, and views and opinions. They make stars. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they do, yes. <laughs> and, um, as I said, there's a long uh, history in, in, in uh, discussing these uh, types of topics across multiple disciplines. Uh, in fact, if you go to the basics of decision theory, uh, going back to all the way to 1950s, you see traces of this question to the work of Amen. Um, in our community, to uh, the a series of papers by uh, uh, Borkar and Varaya, uh, in economics, the work of uh, Gail and Kariv, and later Rosenberg and others, uh, the work of Ilan Lobel, Asu uh, Dagler and Daron Osamuglu, and some of our work, and uh, work of Elkhanan Mosel and Omar Tammuz, they've been trying to sort of investigate how uh, rational individuals in, in, in groups make decisions based on uh, opinions of, of others or actions of others and, and their private observations. There's also a parallel line of literature in which uh, the argument is that you know, rational updating of opinions uh, as evidenced by some experimental results uh, in uh, behavioral economics literature is, is too hard and therefore people use rule of thumb and heuristic rules for, for updating their, uh, their decisions. And these two camps have sort of evolved somewhat uh, independently. Uh, there's a long history for, for both of them. Uh, and of course, um, one canonical model that has been uh, used quite a bit across uh, multiple communities, it's sort of the uh, consensus uh, based on averaging model uh, or the De Groot model, which goes back to early 70s, uh, has its uh, uh, origins in, in the work of Stone in, in late 50s, I believe. And the idea is that if you think of uh, opinions as, uh, as sort of a probabilistic vector, Think of, you know, you have multiple decisions, you create a probability vector which tells you your affinity to each or uh, your belief in, in each of the uh, possible states. And one way to aggregate these opinions is for individuals in a network to repeatedly average these. And uh, eventually, uh, hopefully, if the network is connected, to reach uh, a sort of a type of a consensus. And there's a large literature in, in statistics going back to 1980s that built on, built on this work and tries to figure out what are the right ways of aggregating or fusing different uh, probabilistic uh, opinions or beliefs. Uh, is averaging the right thing? Uh, is, uh, are other functions that one needs to use to average? And so there's a lot of literature on, on trying to figure this out. And um, actually, the, the it's amazing how diverse the set of communities that have looked at this problem is. You know, if you go back to, uh, like I said, the work, uh, uh, decision theory and statistics, that's sort of natural, also economics, but you also see this in political science and, and in economics where there's a, uh, lots and lots of uh, literature in trying to figure out what's the right way to fuse uh, uh, probabilistic opinions. 
And uh, of course, uh, in, in viewing how one does this in a network setting, the natural question to ask is, well, what, how do you do this when you have a, a single agent? In that, the, the sort of the uh, rational benchmark is to use uh, a repeated application of Bayes' rule as a way to uh, update opinions. The idea is that you start with some probabilistic model, uh, which is sort of your, your likelihood function. You have a prior, you get the observation, and then you compute your posterior according to Bayes' rule, which we know from undergraduate probability. Now, if you have a stream of observations that are IID, you can use these observations to deform your uh, prior over time, and then you get this type of, a, uh, uh, of an update with with a normalizer, you could see that the update is log linear in, in, in your pro uh, previous beliefs. And we sort of know the conditions under which the beliefs converge. We know even you know, from Chernoff-Stein lemma that uh, the convergence is exponentially fast if the states are separable uh, according to the KL distances between likelihoods defined at different states. So basically the idea is you have the prior, you have a likelihood, you have the observation, you have this normalizer, which is the probability of observation, and you keep repeatedly, you can do this. And this is sort of the uh, benchmark uh, of rational uh, decision making. And the question, of course, that we want to ask is how does one generalize this to a network setting? And uh, many people, of course, have, have, have looked at this, both on the statistics side, on the economic side, and, and, and so forth. And uh, experimental evidence suggests that this is actually uh, a hard thing to do. And the amount of calculations that you need to do to do this uh, Bayesian benchmark in a network setting is sort of beyond the cognitive ability of, of, of individuals. And the reason is that you don't, you don't have access to other people's observation, you are seeing their beliefs, but their beliefs are influenced by their own observations and the belief of their neighbors, which is influenced by their own observations and beliefs of their neighbors. And because you only see your immediate neighborhood, you have to somehow, from observation of the belief, be able to reason about what was the signal that led to the belief that you're observing. And this inferential task seems to be hard. Um, and so disentangling the influence of neighbors' beliefs and their private signals is not an easy task. And uh, there's uh, multiple behavioral experiments that show that you know, the way people actually update their opinions is not, in groups, is not consistent with what the Bayesian view would suggest. But what is the computational uh, aspect of this was not uh, fully studied as, as far as I can tell. Uh, recently, we actually uh, were able to show that even computing the one step of the Bayesian posterior in the network setting based on the observation of your neighbor is, uh, is actually uh, NP-hard. Basically, if I give you a, a, a network um, and then each have one private, uh, you know, one private uh, signal, and they form their beliefs, even if I start from a common prior, I have the belief of my neighbors, and I want to compute the Bayesian posterior as if I had the observation of anyone in the, in the network. And you can show uh, in, in certain case, worst case scenarios, that you can encode two well-known hard problems in, into this, both the uh, subset sum problem and, and the exact cover. Um, and uh, in one case, uh, as the network grows, we need the diversity of the distribution of the signals to, to grow. And in the other, uh, on the right side, what we need is uh, basically to have uh, nodes in the network whose degree uh, grows with n. We believe these can be further relaxed. We don't, but you know, our reduction was, was uh, quite straightforward and simple. So, yes? It's probably sharp p complete. <coughs> it's probably sharp p complete, but we were not able to show it. Actually, that's a very good point. It's probably sharp p complete, and it's probably com uh, sharp p complete to even approximate. I think, but you know, uh, um, but this is sort of as far as we've gone, uh, uh, sort of so far. Now, so given this hardness that, you know, behaviorally this is hard, computationally this is hard, so what have people been doing? One idea based on this uh, De Groot model is just to, as we said, repeatedly average uh, the priors with the values of the neighbors. 
But the problem with this is that, as you know, we all know from uh, basic you know, Markov chain theory or non-negative matrix theory, this ends up being some weighted average of the initial beliefs. And the weights in this weighted average are the influence of each node in, in the network. You can think of them as the centrality of no, uh, nodes in the network. So how much say you have in, in pushing this weighted average has nothing to do with what you know. It's basically how much of the network traffic goes, goes through you. And uh, the problem with this is that this update suffers from redundancy neglect. Right? You cannot remove the redundancy in, in, the, uh, um, in the beliefs that are reported to you. Uh, because if three people report the same thing to you, you give it three times the weight, not knowing that there might have been uh, a node two hops away that gave the same uh, information. And so, and the thing about the Bayesian updating is that it precisely has a way of removing this redundancy. And the, the issue is that doing this in a distributed way uh, is hard. So, uh, what we have been thinking about in the past few years is to uh, try to merge these two views together. Uh, on the one side, we want to allow for arrival of new observations. On the other hand, we want to inject some more rationality into these models. So we came up with another heuristic that tries to interpolate between uh, the Bayesian and, and the De Groot model a few years ago, which was this idea that um, we can average uh, the, uh, the beliefs with the private Bayesian posterior. In other words, first assume that you have no neighbors, compute your Bayesian posterior, and then average the result with the prior of your neighbors. And then we thought, okay, so we proved a bunch of results for, for, uh, for this update. And then we said, well, why just average? Why can't I do something else? Maybe I can also average the logs instead of averaging the beliefs. Um, and we were also able to show that, in fact, you can rederive this update in which you average the logs of the uh, uh, beliefs of your neighbors with your private Bayesian posterior as a distributed algorithm for solving the centralized inference problem. Uh, I'm sorry? If you, if you approach an epsilon with a log approximation, you'd be off by a lot in the... Well, so the idea here is that you want the log of the beliefs on the wrong states to uh, to go to negative infinity, right? And actually, I think Praveen and Borkan looked at the network versions of these. Uh, yeah, they looked at the cyclic. And then you can also sometimes agree to disagree, right? Say so what? You can agree to disagree. Yes. Yes. And you may not even converge. You may not have consensus. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So there are all these depending on what type of. But they look at the full Bayesian update in the particular case where you can characterize the full Bayesian case when you have two states. So in the cyclic network, there are some symmetries that you can explore that allows you uh, to, to do this. Um, but here, we showed that, OK, it's the log of the beliefs also under certain conditions on the connectivity of the network and, and on the weights uh, works. What, what does work mean? It means that the belief on the wrong states will go to 0 exponentially fast. And all the belief gets concentrated on the correct state. And you reach consensus on a belief that is degenerate and concentrated on, on the correct state, assuming that globally there's enough information to learn the state. So after that, we started thinking, well, what is so special about these two specific updates? Um, in the end, I'm just throwing out all these heuristic ways of doing things without really understanding uh, what's going on. What are the limits? of these type of updates. And more precisely, is there a way for me to see how these updates are removed from the fully Bayesian setting? Right? How can I relate the fully Bayesian setting to, to these set of updates? So we decided to embed this into a larger class of problems so that hopefully, um, at least in certain settings, uh, uh, also includes the fully Bayesian update. And that's what I want to talk about. When does this generalized setting include the Bayesian update as a special case? And when it doesn't? And what are the consequences of, of that? So what we're going to do is we're going to define a family of updates. Instead of 
trying to look at a particular functional form. We want to leave this functional form open and try to see if from first principles we can rederive what this functional form should be. And so we say that um, the, the most general thing that we can handle, what would it look like? So you have some aggregation rule or some social learning rule, which we call this FIT, that could be potentially time varying and could differ for different agents. And this social learning rule takes a look at each node's belief and each neighbor's, each node's neighbor's beliefs, and it looks at the entire history of that node and its neighbors, right? And then by somehow aggregating these beliefs, it spits out a belief. And then with this interim belief, that is the result of this aggregation, we run the, the single agent Bayesian update, okay? Um, so this FIT is a function that takes beliefs of each node and its neighbors for the entire t plus one seconds, which is the, uh, the entire uh, history. So what assumptions should this F satisfy? And this is what I wanna briefly talk about. The full details are in, are in a somewhat long paper. I'd be happy to send it to you. It's about to appear uh, hopefully soon. So instead of writing down the rules, we write down a set of desirable properties for these rules. The first desirable property um, uh, is what we call label neutrality. The idea here is that if I have this uh, aggregation of beliefs, does it matter really if I relabel the states and aggregate versus aggregating and then relabeling, okay? So note that this notation I use in here with the T as the, as the soup index uh, encodes the entire history over time. So this is the belief of myself and my neighbors for all time. And then I'm saying if I permute the indices of the states, if I aggregate and then permute, or if I permute and then aggregate, this should not make a difference, okay? The second one is one which is motivated by how the Bayes rule actually works. Basically says that if I condition my beliefs on a subset of states and then aggregate, I should get the same answer as when I aggregate and then condition. Another way to say this is that if I care about the belief uh, on a subset of the states, I should only care about my neighbor's beliefs on those states and, and, and nothing more. So this is what we call uh, independence of irrelevant uh, alternatives. So I don't care about uh, states that don't matter to me. If I condition and aggregate is the same as aggregating and then condition. So uh, these are conditions that at least in, uh, Question. yes, sorry. Does label neutrality imply that every I has the same <coughs> aggregation? Like FIT is equal to FIJ, uh, FJT? Not necessarily, no, no. Because I'm comparing it to um, its own rule. So I'm saying if I aggregate the states and permute the index, or if I permute the index and then aggregate, I should get the same answer. The third one is monotonicity with respect to the immediate, with respect to the previous step. Um, it's hard to parse the, uh, the, the notation here in a, in a few minutes, but basically it says if I have two belief profiles that pretty much agree on everything, and then um, one of the agents was lower on a particular state and then suddenly became higher, I should take that as a signal that that agent observed uh, an observation that increased the belief on that. So uh, the aggregation rule should sort of notice this and, and act accordingly. So there needs to be a, a monotonicity with respect to the immediate history. And then finally, this is what we claim is our, the main uh, basically uh, deviation from Bayesian rationality where we state that the aggregation rule should not depend on the entire history but depend only on the last thing that was reported. If you look at all these other heuristics, they all have the same setting, whereas the Bayes rule does not have this. So this is our main departure from rationality. We're basically saying that um, it really, uh, I don't have enough processing power to maintain the entire history of everyone's belief. 
on, on everything. And at every time step, I look at the last thing that they report to me as sort of a sufficient statistic of what they know. Okay? So under these four uh, axioms, we're able to show that uh, the only update that satisfies these axioms is a log linear update. Okay, that if I look at the log ratio of the posterior beliefs is a weighted combination, a linear combination of the log ratio of the prior beliefs. And the only update that satisfies these are, uh, uh, these axioms is this one, okay? So in particular, this means that our uh, subject to those axioms, our belief rule is precisely like this, that we um, look at the log ratio, um, a weighted combination of the log ratio of neighbors priors plus the log ratio of, of the likelihoods. And then the next question is, given these axioms, what uh, uh, properties should these weights satisfy for the beliefs to eventually reach consensus on, on the true state? And then here's where we see an interesting connection to the literature on uh, group polarization in uh, social psychology. So group polarization is tendency to make decisions in groups that are more extreme than initial inclinations. This is something that has been sort of evidence in a, in a few uh, psychological uh, studies. And there are two uh, prevailing explanations for this. One is called social comparison theory, which roughly speaking, it states that uh, when you have a group of like-minded people, you want to be like the rest of the group, but you want to distinguish yourself. So you compare yourself to the rest of the group, you tilt your opinions in, a, in the extreme direction to stand out, okay? The other uh, uh, explanation for this is what is called the in, uh, information influence, which basically states that um, you have some reasons for believing what you believe when you get into the room with a gr group of like-minded people, and then you hear other independent arguments for the same beliefs, things that you did not consider before. And they become further evidence for your beliefs, so you, your beliefs in what, the direction that you were going strengthen further. So these are the two sort of prevailing explanations for group polarization. There's been some experimental studies sort of verifying this. If you have two groups, one is prejudiced, one is not. After the discussion, you see the shifting of, of the sort of the, the, the beliefs to, to sort of the more uh, extreme direction. Um, so in, in our setting, what this amounts to, uh, in the sort of the log linear setting, is to have um, basically the spectral radius of the weights that define that network to be greater than one. We call that uh, uh, the social learning rule group polarizing. If uh, the spectral radius is less than one, we call it depolarizing, and if it's equal to one, we call it non-polarizing, and we showed that uh, if you, know, you satisfy the axioms that your network is strongly connected, you converge if and only if the groups, the opinions are non-polarizing. And the idea is the following. The beliefs somehow convey information that are buried in private observations, okay? In the end, what you'd like to do to learn is to aggregate all the private observations that you don't have direct access to. If you weigh them too much, you will spread misinformation. If you weigh them too little, you will attenuate possibly good information. And the only way that you can get, allow this weight to, for things to get carried out so that law of large numbers can kick in is for the spectral radius to be equal to one. And the sufficient condition for that is for the weights to add up to one. So if you pick the induced infinity norm of the matrix to be one, then that's a sufficient condition for spectral radius to be one. Of course, you can have the spectral radius be one, but some weights, some rows add up to greater than one and some rows add up to less than one. Now, the question is what happens if I allow for the weights to change? If I allow for the weights to change, um, assuming that uh, uh, eventually uh, the rule is unanimous, and what that means is equivalent to having the, spec uh, the row sums be equal to one, meaning that 
if all the consensus is a fixed point of, of, of this update, then um, you can actually prove that learning happens even when the weights decay as time goes to infinity. So it's standard in sort of the consensus literature which doesn't have the Bayesian part of this update to assume that uh, when the weights are positive, they're uniformly greater than some minimum weight epsilon. We didn't want to make that assumption because we felt like you know, over time you might attenuate the influence of, of some members in the social clique. So we derive conditions under which uh, even as the weights change, uh, without having a uniform lower bound, you could still have uh, uh, basically convergence to consensus. Now let me say, uh, I described these axioms. I mentioned that Bayesian satisfies three out of the four. But does, it doesn't always satisfy the three out of the four. And that's exactly the, uh, the cases in which it doesn't satisfy some of those axioms is where you get the difficulty in the Bayesian updating. So if you have the settings like this, where there are multiple independent paths, then you can't write down the, uh, the, uh, the Bayesian update in closed form. If you exclude the updates of this form, the settings of this form, then you can actually explicitly write down what the Bayesian looks like. And it's exactly like the update we had, except now it has more memory, because now you have to include the entire history to be able to remove the redundancy in data. Not only that, the weights actually have a very nice combinatorial inter interpretation. They are Mobius inversion coefficients. Uh, the same ones that are used in you know, inclusion exclusion formulas. Because in the end, all you're doing is you're trying to remove the redundancy. You're basically saying which ones are redundant, and so I have to remove. So in this case, in this picture here, if I have an edge from two to six, then I can write the update this way. But if I don't have the edge from two to six, there is no way for agent six to remove the double counting of the log belief ratio of agent two. So no matter what, agent two's beliefs will be double counted in, in this setting. Um, do I have another minute? Uh, let me, so these are the, some examples of networks that, uh, for which the uh, Bayes rule can be explicitly uh, characterized. We've generalized this result to the case where the update is not log linear, but has just some general positive homogeneous uh, nonlinear function. Basically, we show that uh, uh, when this update is positive homogeneous, if it's of degree greater than one, then agents mislearn with positive probability. If it's less than one, then agents remain uncertain forever. So it has to be homogeneous of degree one. And not only that, the curvature of that update has to be bounded. And these are tight conditions. So we have, if you take the logarithm of the, of the rule and you take the uh, second derivative of the log and normalize it by the first derivative, this has to be bounded between minus one and one. And th this is a tight result, meaning that if the update is outside that, the update uh, will not result in learning. So let me, uh, we had some results on the rates for this. Let me just put the conclusion slide. Uh, we developed a general family of non-Bayesian models, described the connection to Bayesian ones, derived uh, them from the axioms, showed that Bayesian learning is, in general, is hard. Um, and uh, we have some sufficient conditions on network structures under which the Bayesian learning derives directly from axiom. And, uh, and we're running some experiments right now to, to see if we can uh, test some of these. Let me stop here, thank you. Yes? Can agents have start out with different prior beliefs than what happens? So this update actually, as long as the, um, no one puts zero belief on truth. There is no truth. I mean, there is no, I mean, uh, uh, ex post. Uh -huh. so, if, um, so if everyone puts zero belief on what ends up being the true state, then obviously um, the, the linear one doesn't work. The log linear one uh, would, would still work, but the linear one doesn't. Would that be rational? 
No, so this update is not rational because we said the rational one is hard. We're saying. Right. Yeah, we can, I, you know, there's a, the update is not rational in the way that you include other people's beliefs because you're not removing redundancy in those, in those beliefs. Uh, which one? Uh, observing other people's beliefs is kind of tricky, but people usually observe actions of others. Not yes, yes. So, so some of these, that's a very good point. So you can think of actions, at least in the binary setting, as quantized beliefs. Um, we have some results on actions as well. Uh, and I believe the hardness result is actually more on the action case than, than the belief case. Uh, but the explicit form, no, we don't have that. Yeah. No, the convergence condition. Um, in certain graphs, we do. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.